I had studied philosophy for many years, had two degrees, position in the university world, and never met one person in my life who knew the Lord Jesus Christ personally. And then I met some simple Pentecostal people. I couldn't understand the language that they used. I didn't un understand their theology. I had never heard the gospel, but I knew that they had something that I did not have. I knew that instantly. And the time came when I decided that I wanted what they had, and I went back to an army barrack room, and about 11 o'clock one night, when everybody else was asleep, as a soldier in the British forces, I decided to pray until something happened. And that's when I learned the difference between praying and praying through. I prayed for more than an hour, and nothing happened. In fact, I really didn't even pray, because I didn't know whom I was praying to. I didn't know what to say. I couldn't get off the ground. But somewhere after midnight, I found myself suddenly saying to an unknown person words that were not of my choosing. And these were the words that I said, Unless you bless me, I will not let you go. And when I said, I will not let you go, I could not stop saying, I will not let you go. I will not let you go. And after that, the power of the Holy Spirit came into that room, straightened my body up, lift my hands up into the air, and eventually cast me up on the floor upon my back. And I lay there under the power of the Holy Spirit for well over an hour, while God cleaned my life out, delivered me from demon oppression, and from all the wickedness and the ignorance that I'd lived in so many years. And when I rose from the floor, somewhere in the early hours of the morning, there was one thing I knew for sure. I knew that Jesus Christ is alive. And from that day, which was 1941 until tonight, I have never been able to doubt that Jesus Christ is alive. And that's the most important piece of knowledge that anybody can have in this life. I know him, and I love him. He did for me what no one else could do. He's made himself real to me. He's led me. He's taught me. He's kept me. I feel like the testimony of Jacob in the book of Deuteronomy. He found me in a waste, howling wilderness. And he led me, and he kept me, and he taught me. I spent the next four and a half years still in the British forces. Three years in North Africa, and a year and a half in Palestine. When I was released from the British forces, the same day that I stepped out of the army, in the city of Jerusalem, I became a missionary to the Jewish people. That was in 1946. And I have been in full-time gospel ministry from then until now. I thank God for all the things that he's done for me. For one year on end in North Africa, I lay sick in a military hospital, or a series of military hospitals, with a condition that the doctors apparently were not able to cure. I lay there knowing that I was saved, knowing that I was a child of God, having received the baptism from the Holy Spirit and longing to know how I could receive healing from God. I said to myself, I know that God could heal me by a miracle. I didn't doubt that. But no miracle happened. And then I said to myself, I know if I had faith, God would heal me. But the next thing I said every time was, but I don't have faith. And somewhere in the third or the fourth or the fifth month in that period in hospital, I came to the place that Bunyan calls the Slough of Despond. And then in that darkness there shone one bright, penetrating, piercing ray of light. It came from the 10th chapter of Romans in the 17th verse. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the fact that I grasp is this, that faith comes. If you don't have it, you can get it. Never sit back in despair and say, I don't have faith. Maybe that's true, but you can get it. And I learned over about eight months what it means to hear the Word of God. I learned how to listen to God. I learned how to set aside my own preconceptions, my philosophic background, my ideas of religion. I turned to the Bible to see what it had to say about healing. I did a very simple thing, a very childlike thing. I took a blue pencil, and I decided I'd read through the entire Bible from beginning to end, underlining in blue every scripture that referred to healing, health, strength, and long life. And it took me maybe four or five months to do that. And do you know what I had at the end? A blue Bible. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
But I was a philosopher, and they're the hardest people I imagine God has to deal with. If you've never been a philosopher, my advice is don't be one. <laughs> a philosopher will make even the simplest thing difficult. Why, we spent one semester at Cambridge discussing whether we could really know that the pulpit or the desk from which the lecturer lectured was really there. And we never did solve the problem. <laughs> and as I began to read these scriptures, Bless the Lord, O my soul, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, and many, many others like them, the thought would come to me, that's too good to be true. Why, if, if, it, if that were really true, why God would want me to be healthy and strong and live out my days and never be sick. And this was so contrary to my picture of religion that I found it almost impossible to accept it because my idea of religion was something that helps you to be miserable and, 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 and put up with it. In fact, in the Anglican Church where I was brought up, there are certain things I'll never forget. The general confession every Sunday morning around about 11.15, I can still say that, pardon us, miserable offenders. And as a boy in my teens, I looked at those people and I said, they're surely miserable. <laughs> and then I said to myself, if that's all relig religion can do is make me a miserable offender, I can be an offender without religion and a lot less miserable. <laughs> and that was my ambition until the Lord found me. But there were many things, as with most of us, from our religious background that we don't easily take off. And so I still had the idea that it was somewhat sinful to be happy. And that if you wanted to be holy, you certainly had to be poor and you'd probably be sick as well. So when I began to read these scriptures, it was hard for me to absorb them. And one day I had a little mental dialogue with the Lord. I did not hear him speak audibly, but it was just as clear as if he had done. As I sat in bed and thought to myself, that's too good to be true, that couldn't be. The Lord said to me, wait a minute now, would you mind telling me one thing? Who is the teacher and who is the pupil? And I said, Lord, you're the teacher and I'm the pupil. And he said, would you mind letting me teach you? <laughs> and after that, I decided I'd listen to what he had to say. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Lots of people hear the Bible read and never hear it. Lots of people hear the gospel preached and never hear it. Lots of people read the Bible, but their minds are closed to what God is saying. The, book, the, the scripture that got me out of hospital was the fourth chapter of Proverbs, verses 20, 21, and 22. My son, attend to my word. Incline thine ear unto my saying. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. And when I got to that final phrase, health to all their flesh, then, praise God, some of my logic came to my aid. And I said to myself, if God has provided health for all my flesh, then there can be no room for sickness, because health and sickness cannot occupy the same area at the same time. And I saw that God had made provision for me to have health in all my flesh. My other great problem was, as a philosopher, I tended to spiritualize everything, and when God talked about healing, I referred it to the healing of my soul, but I assumed that God didn't refer to my body. But when he said flesh, that settled it. And I looked again at that scripture, and I saw that in the King James Version that I had, the alternative reading in the margin, in place of health, was medicine. Now, I was a medical orderly in the British forces, and I knew about medicine. And so I saw that God had provided me, as his child, with a medicine that would make and keep me healthy. Now, as I was meditating on this and determining to take this medicine, the Lord spoke to me again, and he said, when a doctor gives a patient medicine, the directions are on the bottle. And he said, the directions are on my bottle, you better read them. And I went back to Proverbs 4, verses 20 and 21, and read them many, many times. My son, attend to my word. Incline thine ear unto my saying, let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of thine heart. For then they are life to those that find them, and health to all their flesh. 
and I saw that there were four directions that I had to follow. Attend to my words. Listen with attention. Dismiss every distracting thought from your mind. Incline thine ear, that is, to bow down the head. Be humble. Be teachable. Don't argue with God. Don't tell God what he should have said. Be willing to listen to what he has said. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep both eyes focused on the promises of God. A great Pentecostal preacher of the last generation, Smith Wigglesworth, once said this about divine healing. He said, the trouble with many of God's people is that they have a spiritual squint. One eye is on the Bible and the other is on the doctrine. And then the fourth condition was, keep them in the midst of thine heart. And then I read the next verse of Proverbs 4.23, says this, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And years later, when I was working as a missionary in Africa amongst a tribe called the Maragolians, of whom we have a little girl that's our adopted daughter now, I saw this translated into their language, and it made such an impact on me that I've always remembered it. For in the Maragoli language, Luragoli, the scripture says this, Guard thy heart with all thy strength. For all the things that there are in life come out of it. And that's the truth. Everything in your life is settled from one source. What you have in your heart, whether you succeed or whether you fail, will depend not on external circumstances, not on the government, not on the church, not on the preacher. It depends on what you have inside you in that vital region the scripture calls the heart. God showed me that if through the ear gate and the eye gate and through the right attitude of attention, I could receive the word of God into my heart, out of my heart, it would work health and strength and vitality and long life. And that is as true for every person here as for me. God has no favor. He says, my son, and that means my child, my son or my daughter, attend to my word. Incline thine ear unto my saints. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health or medicine to all their flesh. I took one further decision. I asked the doctor to discharge me from hospital uncured. The first doctor wouldn't do it. He transferred me to another hospital. I asked the next doctor, and after some considerable time, the doctor agreed. Now, I am not against doctors. I believe God is against sickness, and God fights sickness through doctors and through other means. But I am no critic of doctors. I thank God for every doctor and nurse that is helping to alleviate human suffering in one way or another. But God showed me in this particular situation that I'd had all the doctors to do, and it had not proved sufficient, and I must take my eye off all human sources of health, put my faith in God alone. So I stepped out of hospital uncured, without any recourse. No doctor would accept further responsibility for me, and I did something very, very simple. Remember, I was a medical orderly, and this was my medicine. I decided to take it the way people usually take their medicine, three times daily after meal. Now, that may sound simple to you, but I'll tell you something, it worked. After each main meal, I would go aside, bow my head, close my eyes, say, God, you've said that these words of yours will be medicine to all my flesh, and I'm taking them as that now in the name of Jesus. The army sent me to the worst climate that it could find for my particular condition in the continent of Africa, which was the Sudan, the city of Khartoum, where the temperature goes as high as 127 degrees heat being the worst thing for my condition. But God's promises are not given upon the basis of external conditions. God is God at the equator or the North Pole. And all I did was take his word as my medicine three times daily after meals. And within two or three months, I was perfectly healthy. And the crown of my head, the soles of my feet, his word had become health to all my flesh. Not merely did I receive healing, but I received something much more important that I didn't realize. When I became sick, I was a converted philosopher. My mental attitudes, my categories, my mental reactions were those of a philosopher. But when I had to hold on to the Word of God for very physical life itself, the Word of God so permeated my mind and my thoughts and my expressions that when I was healed, I had a totally new mental outlook. I had been renewed in the spirit of my mind. And I'll tell you what it is to be spiritually minded. It's not to be mysterious. It's not to be a mystic. It's to think about everything the way that God speaks about it in his Word. That to be as spiritually minded as it's possible to be. And I had come to that place. There may be those of you here tonight who are sick. You're possibly past medical help. I want to tell you tonight, you are not past the help of God. Sometimes we have to get desperate before we reach out and lay hold upon Almighty God. God loved desperation. A little woman with the issue of blood who hadn't been healed after 12 years used her last ounce of strength to press through the crowd and touch the border of his garment. I don't believe she had another ounce of strength left, but she didn't need it. But when she got there, she was healed and health and strength and vitality came flooding back into her whole being. From then onward, I have preached what I believe to be the full gospel. 
I've always preached that Jesus saves from sin, that he heals the sick, that he baptizes believers in the Holy Spirit, and they speak with other tongues. I've preached that the coming of the Lord is near, but from time to time God has expanded my ministry, and I praise God there's a lot more expanding still needed. I served as a pastor in London, England, after we returned from Israel for about eight years, and then my wife and I went as missionaries to East Africa, worked there for five years in the country of Kenya. We worked amongst the young people of East Africa in educational work training teachers for the schools of Africa, and in those years we were privileged to witness a very precious outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon those young people. It was there in Africa that I saw that God meant exactly what he said, and he was going to do exactly what he said. In Acts 2, 17, it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. God showed me that when he said all flesh, he meant all flesh. He meant every section of the human race without one except every section of the church and every race and every country. Regardless of government or political affiliation or denominational background, God is visiting all flesh with the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. God also showed me that there is a special emphasis upon the young people, your sons, your daughters, your young men. This visitation is for, is for all of us, but it's especially for the generation that's just coming into adulthood now. And if ever a generation needed the help of God, that's the generation. At one time, in this work in East Africa, I took stock of the situation after we'd been there about a year, and I saw that there was a certain measure of outward conformity, but that there was a lack of real inner faith and commitment amongst our African students. So one day when there was an assembly of the students, I said, I want to speak to you, and I said, I thank you for your cooperation, your willingness to obey. I said, whatever we tell you to do, you do. If we tell you to be confirmed, you'll be confirmed. If we tell you to be baptized, you'll be baptized. And I said, I know the reason for this is that you know that your education depends upon us, and you desperately want education. And I said, I understand that, and I sympathize with it. But I said, in the minds of most of you, there remains a great big question mark. And when I said that, they became attentive. They wanted to know. And I said, the question that's in your minds is this. Is the Bible merely a white man's book with white man's customs and traditions that does not apply to people in Africa? Or is it a book with a message from God that is for African people as well? And I said, many of your tribal elders and others tell you privately that this is just a white man's book and you can't expect an African to live the way that white men can live. And when I looked at their faces, I saw I had their attention. And then I said, I want to tell you one more thing. I cannot answer that question. The only way you'll know the answer to that question is if you have a personal experience of the supernatural power of God in your life. Because when that comes, you'll know that it didn't come from Britain, and it didn't come from America, but that it came from God. And I dismissed the assembly with those words. I didn't argue with them. I left them. By every means in my power, having the opportunity to do it, I put the word of God before those young people. In many ways that they scarcely realized, I brought them under the influence of the word of God. And I prayed to God, and I said this, God, you said in your word, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we sow to the flesh, we shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if we sow to the spirit, we shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And I said, Lord, I am sowing to the Spirit in their lives the incorruptible seed of the Word of God, and I claim the harvest. Some little while after that, a young African evangelist turned up without any introduction. He'd never gone beyond grade five at school because his parents could not pay the fees. He'd gone down a long way from his own area to Mombasa, found the Lord, and witnessed the crusade in which Brother T.L. Osborne preached in Mombasa. And in his own simple way, he said, if Brother Osborne can do it, I can do it. And you know, God likes that kind of reasoning. This young man turned up at our college one day, and I didn't really know anything about it. I said to my wife, we'll invite him in and talk. Then I said, let's have a time of prayer. And when young, that young man prayed, he was at the gates of heaven. I said, we'll turn him loose. Uh, he didn't have a tremendous message. He had a guitar that he didn't play very well and some songs, but God broke loose in that school, that college. The next year, we had 57 students, men and women, that graduated. When they came to the college, I questioned whether 10 of them knew the Lord personally. When they left, every one of them had been saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit. This was not a religious college. It was a secular college for teachers. And in those years, we had almost continuous moving of the Spirit of God. We used to have a voluntary evening service in the college, which was 
would start at 7.30. And at, when God was moving, the attendance would be about 90% of the students. They said, we have to turn the lights out, or rather the, the uh, central authority turned off the mission generator at 10.30 at night. They said, we don't have enough time. Let's start our meetings at 7 o'clock. And I would, we would begin by somebody singing choruses, and there would be outside my house a line of young men and women saying, can I testify tonight? I would say, no, you testified last night, last week. It's somebody else's turn this week. And we would have testimonies, and then I would preach the word of God to them. Now, they did not understand. I could not speak the speed I'm speaking to you tonight. I would have to choose the words that I used, but by carefully speaking and slowing down, I could preach the word of God to them in a way that they would understand. When I went there, I have to say this, it's a fact. Some of my fellow missionaries said, you really just wasting your time teaching the Africans. They don't understand. I didn't believe that. And I took time. About two years later, the missionaries used to come down to those meetings to get blessed. After I had taught the Word of God, we would just open up the meeting for prayer and worship. God would move in regularly week by week. I found it difficult to lead Africans into the vocal gifts of the Spirit. Interpretation and prophecy did not come easily to them, but things such as the Word of Knowledge and the Word of Wisdom would come to them just as simply as eating bread off the table. And Sunday after Sunday, they would go out the hand, Please, sir, the Lord has just spoken to me. And I'd say, Don't tell me, just come out and tell everyone. I remember one situation in those meetings that I suppose my wife and I will always remember. I think I'll introduce this uh, little story about Billy Sunday that I heard. It's related. I wasn't present, of course, but Billy Sunday was preaching somewhere, and in the midst of his sermon, he stopped and said, How many men are there that have never quarreled with their wives here? And after a little while, about 12 men all over a big congregation stood up. Billy Sunday said, Now you're looking at the 12 biggest liars. Sit down. <laughs> At that time, I was working from about 6 in the morning till 10.30 at night and had very little time at home. My wife was getting... She was not satisfied. She said, I didn't... <laughs> You've got to remember all this is on tape. You never know where it'll end up. <laughs> she had very, very good reasons. Believe me, I see her side of it. Well, one Sunday evening, we didn't, we didn't have an argument, but we had a discussion. <laughs> and we did not resolve that discussion by the time we went down to that evening meeting. But we went through with the meeting and the singing, the testimonies, I preached, and it was a long, narrow room. The students sitting in rows behind the tables that they used as desks during the week, and my table was at the end. But when I finished speaking... I went and sat down with my back to the side wall beside my wife, and we were thus seated sideways on to the body of students who were facing forward. And they began to worship the Lord, and I looked out, and I saw one young woman, I suppose she was maybe 18 or 19 years old, and as I looked, there was almost a visible light shining on her face. And I remember thinking to myself, there's someone that's in touch with God. And as I was watching her, and I want to say that from that moment onward, she never opened her eyes. She stood to her feet and moved out into the center aisle, which was not easy to do, walked straight up the center of the aisle, came to the end, turned left, walked straight up to my wife and me, all the time with her eyes closed, dropped on her knees, reached out her left hand and took my wife's left hand, and her right hand and took my right hand, and holding our two hands together, she began to pour out her soul in intercession for the young people of her nation. Now, she was a black girl and a student, and I was a white man and the principal of the college. And in the natural, she had no means whatever of knowing that there had been a disagreement between my wife and me. But under the impulse of the Holy Spirit, she came right out, faced us, united us by holding our hands, and poured out her soul in intercession, showing that God asked us to make a sacrifice that we might minister to the young people of her nation. This is what the scripture says. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a doctrine, a psalm, a revelation, an interpretation, a tongue, that all things be done unto edify. Christians shouldn't come to church merely to receive. They should come to give. Every believer in the New Testament church, by virtue of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, came as a contributor. They came to share. They came into fellowship. Each one ministered to another. This is the way it should be. During those four or five years in East Africa, amongst those young people who were mainly between the age of 18 and 25, I would say at one time or another we saw all the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation. That's the way they're described in the New Testament. People say, do you ever see the dead raised? Some people think that's impossible. But I, during those years, we saw two people brought back to life from death in answer to prayer. Two of our students, a man the first year and a woman the second. The remarkable thing was they had really no contact with one another, but their description of what their spirit experienced when it was 
released from the body by death was almost objectively identical. I remember when the second case happened, the girl had gone home because she was sick, and one Sunday morning, her brother came on a bicycle, said, come and pray for Teresa, she's desperately ill. So we went without breakfast, put the bicycle on top of the car, and drove out to a little so-called clinic in the hill. And it was really just like the scene with Jairus' daughter. The family were there weeping and wailing. I think most of them were believers. But I had no premeditated plan as to what I would do. But when I got there, I said, would you like us to pray for Teresa? They said, yes. I said, with you all go out, my wife and I will pray. And she lay on the bed absolutely without any evidence of life. My wife knelt down on one side, and I knelt down on the other side of the bed, and we started to pray. And at a certain given moment, we eat raised up with the assurance of victory. And Teresa sat bolt upright in the bed instantly. You know, the first thing she said, has anyone got a Bible? I said, yes. She said, read Psalm 41. I fetched out my Bible and read it. When she was out of the clinic and better, I said to her, why did you ask me to read Psalm 41? Now, the African does not speak about a vision. He just records his experiences. She said, and then she said, at a certain moment, all the pain and the sickness ended. And she said, two white men stood by me, two men clothed in white. And they said, come with us. And I walked with them along a very straight, narrow pathway a long, long way. She said, I came to a place where everybody was clothed in white and the lights were very, very bright and there was a man reading from a big Bible and he was reading Psalm 41. So she said, when I came back, I wanted to know what was in Psalm 41. At the end of 1957, I beg your pardon, the end of 1961, we left East Africa and came back to Europe on our way to Canada for a year's furlough. Round about Christmas 1961, right at the end of 1961, beginning of 1962, I was uh, with my wife in a place in the north of Denmark called Dutton. The Danes don't call it that. If there are any Scandinavians here, you'll know what I mean. My wife is Danish. That's why we were there. We were staying with her sister up in the little place right out on the sea. And there's a place there on the cliffs where I love to go and get alone and just worship God and have communion with God. And I was out there one day at this time. The Lord began to speak to me. Now, I want to say that he did not speak with an audible voice, but it was as clear and as precise as if he had done. And he said, no, you have come so far. You have been a pastor, you have been a missionary in two countries, you're the member of a denomination, you have a pension scheme, you're the principal of a college, so on. Are you satisfied or do you want to go further? And I have to tell you, I blush when I think about it, I really didn't believe there was any further to go. You may think that either conceited or foolish, but many, many, many people I know are just the same. And remember, I knew about salvation, healing, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Lord, holiness of life. I preached these things and seen them work for many years. And really, I didn't know of anything more I needed to know. I knew there were many, many truths in the Bible that I didn't understand, but I mean, from the practical point of view, I didn't know of anything more I needed to know. So when the Lord says, are you satisfied or do you want to go further, it was something of a shock to me. And furthermore, I have learned to be careful in dealing with God. The fifth chapter of Ecclesiastes says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and they are all ready to hear than to speak, and do not give the sacrifice of food, for they consider not that they do evil. And it goes on to say that there's an angel that keeps a record of what we say and one day we're going to have to answer to what we've said and it'll be too late then to say you didn't mean it you don't know that's there you read the first seven verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 5 so when the Lord came with this question I said Lord give me some time I want to think this over so I went away and for about two or three days I don't recall exactly how long I pondered and turned this over in my mind and then I went back to the same place on the cliff got in touch with the Lord and said I'm ready with my answer and I said this no Lord I'm not satisfied if there is anything further I want to go first. And you know, we have to come sometimes to a moment of honesty with God. Only when I said I'm not satisfied did I realize how dissatisfied I really was. And again, I know of thousands of ministers in different sections of the church who are not satisfied but will not face the truth. They argue with themselves, it's always been like this. This is the way it's done. This is the best we can do. There isn't more. And it's somewhat painful to the ego to come to the moment where you say I'm not satisfied. But what a flood of relief came to me when I just said that simple statement, No, Lord, I'm not satisfied. If there is anything further, think of my, think of that. When I think back, I just blush. I said, If there is anything further, 
I want the gopher. And the Lord was ready with his answer, very prompt, very plain, very plain. There are two conditions. First of all, all progress in the Christian life is by faith. If you are not willing to go forward in faith, you cannot go forward. Secondly, if you are to fulfill the ministry that I have for you, you will need a strong, healthy body. And you are putting on too much weight. You better see to that. And that was true. And believe me, Christmas in Denmark is not the season of the year suddenly to start taking off weight. If anybody knows how to celebrate Christmas, it's the Danes. And I mean that. The Swedes and the Norwegians are nothing near them. You'll forgive me saying so, but I know my experience. But I took God seriously. Now, at that time, I made one of my major commitments to God. I think after the commitment of salvation and to serve him as a missionary, that was the most important commitment that I made. I did not realize it. I did not realize it was going to change the course of my life and ministry. I expected to spend a year in Canada and return to the mission field. I spent a year in Canada and without planning it, found myself in the United States at the beginning of 19. 63, and I've been resident here ever since. July of this year, I was granted American citizenship, and I never planned at any time to come to the United States. Let me say, the main reason was that I thought if any nation has enough preachers, it's America. And I still think they do, but they're not the right kind. <laughs> Forgive me for being honest. Now, when I made that commitment to God... It was as though he put me back to what I could call a postgraduate course of spiritual education. I think I could say by that time I was a graduate. But he put me back, and he began to open up entirely new fields of understanding to me. I read the New Testament as if I'd never read it before. There were things in it I just imagined. Couldn't imagine how I had read it without ever seeing. One major field of education that he took me into that time was dealing with evil spirits. Of course, being Pentecostal and believing the Bible, I believe believed in evil spirit had a distance, and that's when I preferred to keep them. Every now and then in my ministry, I'd been backed up into a corner where I had come to the conclusion, this must be a demon. And like most preachers, I thought if I shouted loud enough, something would happen. I have to tell you, demons are not dead. You don't gain anything by shouting at them, except wearing yourself out. God showed me an entirely new aspect. He showed me that the church has been systematically infiltrated by demons, evil spirits, the agents of Satan. That the problem of the Christian church is its fifth column within. That the church is never defeated from without and never will be. But that we have individually and collectively many of us unseen but real personalities fighting against us from within. And he showed me those that were still in me after 15 or 16 years of full gospel ministry. And I had some humbling experiences when the Lord delivered. Then, through a Baptist minister, he brought me face to face for the first time with a real definite dealing with a woman that had evil spirits. She was a good Baptist, and I'm not saying this sarcastically. She was a member of a Baptist church, baptized by immersion upon her faith in Jesus Christ, had gone to an Episcopal church, comically enough, and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking with tongues, and was brought to us by a Baptist minister. And he said, Brother Prince, the Lord has shown me that this woman has evil spirits, and that you and your wife are to be the instruments of deliverance, and it's to happen today. Well, at that time, in 1963, I wasn't used to Baptist ministers that spoke like that. And I put this thing before the Lord, and it seemed to me the Lord said yes. So that woman came, and a group of us, about four or five of us, spent five hours praying with that woman. And during that time, eight separate evil spirits named themselves and came out of her in such a real and positive way that it was no longer possible for me to doubt. The last spirit that came out named itself as death. And when it came out, the woman was on her back on the floor like a dead body for about 15 minutes. Her face, her face was cold, waxen. You could have looked at her and even touched her and said that she was a dead person. Then uh, I was at that time pastoring a Pentecostal church in Seattle. When I saw this and other cases that began to follow, I began to preach to my Pentecostal people about deliverance from evil spirits. You could just as well... Yeah, I did not say that. Let me say it this way. Pentecostals are the slowest to believe in the necessity of deliverance from evil spirits. You can preach to Catholics, they say it's in our prayer book. Episcopalians, they say yes, it's in our prayer book. Presbyterians, they're intellectual, they'll analyze it. But they're, they're Pentecostals, and I've been a Pentecostal more years than most of you, friends. They say, oh, no, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We don't. Deliverance. Well, who knows what would the end have been, but in our Sunday morning worship service, round about 11.30 one Sunday morning, the lady who played the piano, who was as Pentecostal as anybody ever could be, her father was a Pentecostal preacher, her husband was a Pentecostal Bible school student, and so on and so forth. She'd grown up in this. She threw a fit in the midst of my service and lay there on the floor writhing like an animal. And because of the experience that I'd had at home, I knew what her problem was. 
Somebody said to me afterwards, Brother Prince, the accepted procedure in that case is to call one of the deacons and say, our sister isn't feeling well, will you take her down to the basement? But it didn't even enter my head to do that. I said, she needs prayer. We'll pray for her. Summoned my wife, looked around the congregation to see if there was anybody else that could come to my help. And you know, my good, sweet, loveling Pentecostal people couldn't say boo to a demon. But there was a Presbyterian couple there that had worked with us in a couple of previous cases, and they were just ready to go. So I called them down. And that Presbyterian lady, believe me, she was like a terrier after rats when it comes to demons. <laughs> she began to jump up and down in front of this woman and say, You spirit that's in this woman, what is your name? What is your name? And out of the woman's voice, as she writhed on the ground, there came a, out of the woman's throat came a deep, husky, masculine voice, which said, My name is... But he didn't say any more. So I thought, if the, if the Presbyterian lady can do it, I can do it. I always need somebody to give me a little impulse. <laughs> so I took my place in front of her, and I said, Now, you evil spirit that's in this woman, I'm speaking to you and not to the woman. And I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to answer me, What is your name? And it said, my name is, and went no further. And then I got really mad with it. I said, you've got to answer me. The scripture says you're subject unto me through the name of Jesus. And after about the fifth attempt, it came out, my name is Lies. And it shouted so loud that everybody in the church went up and came down with a bump from the seat. <laughs> and I quickly went over in my mind, lying spirit, First Kings chapter 22. God put a lying spirit in the mouth of the prophets of Ahab. That scripture, I said, you lying spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, come out of this woman. And then there started about the most intensive struggle I've ever been involved in in my life. Spiritual, mental, and physical. It was total struggle. And at the end of about ten minutes, we established dominion over that spirit. The woman's mouth opened wide. Her tongue protruded. It was blue in color and twisting like a snake. And with a loud, sustained roar like an express train going past, this evil spirit came out. And the woman collapsed on the floor like an emptied sack. But I knew that wasn't the last one. Thank God I'd had a little private practice. 